Welcome to the Navigating Cancer Together podcast. My name is Talea Dindi. I'm an 11-year cancer thriver, cancer doula, and owner of On the Other Side. I use my experience to help others get on the other side of cancer. Gaps between the guidance, emotional support, and education that are needed and what one receives can be huge. This podcast fills those gaps by sharing stories, resources, and information about all things related to cancer and wellness. I interview guests from all walks of life who are living with cancer, caregivers, and those who are thriving on the other side. Also, I talk with organizations, healthcare professionals, and experts in the health and wellness spaces who offer complimentary and integrative care. Join me. We are in this together. Disclaimer, the purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. The podcast is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. It is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professionals and is not intended for the use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests who speak in a podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conditions conclusions. Neither Talea Dendi, Navigating Cancer Together, On the Other Side, LLC, nor any of its affiliates endorses, supports, or opposes any treatment option or other matter discussed in a podcast. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy on a podcast should not be construed as an endorsement. Hello, everyone. This is Talea Dindi from On the Other Side. Life, and you're listening to the Navigating Cancer Together podcast, the show that has something for everyone facing cancer. Why? Because everyone is different with different needs, beliefs, and perspectives. Thank you for joining us for this episode. I encourage you to open your minds and your hearts. Today, our very special guest is Junie Boucher. Junie uses whole foods nutrition and stress management techniques to bring hormonal balance to the body. She specializes in addressing physiological barriers to sexual desire through improved health in both men and women and breast cancer survivorship. She has been certified in nutritional therapy and she completed a 200-hour meditation teacher training. Her practice is virtual, so Junie is lucky enough to consult with clients worldwide, and she is a proud member of the Rose City Sexual Health Collective, which is located in Portland, Oregon. Junie, thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. Wow. 200 hours of meditation training. We're going to get to that. That's amazing. (laughs) Junie, can you please start off? You are, of course, a breast cancer survivor yourself. Would you please start off by sharing your story with us? Sure. Back in 2019, and like you, I'm familiar with your story as well, that I consider myself a fairly healthy person person. And I did yoga. I meditated. I felt like I ate well. And I was walking my dog one morning and I happened to put my hand up near my chest and I felt something that I had never felt before. And I got into the doctor that day. She wasn't super worried because I was quote unquote too young for cancer. (laughs) And she said, let's go ahead and send you for further tests just to be safe because she did feel it. And within a week I was diagnosed with with breast cancer. It was very scary, of course, because nobody is ever prepared to hear the words, you have cancer. One thing I didn't really expect was that they were quite sure the day I had the ultrasound that it was cancer. And I said, don't you need to do a biopsy to confirm? And they were like, we're pretty sure. And I said, what percentage? The doctor said about 90%. And I've never been super good at math, but (laughs) 90%, it just felt like, oh, that's quite sure. And you know, what transpired after that was he caught it early. 
luckily. I don't know really what happened between when they did the ultrasound and when they actually got in there because there was quite a delay of a number of months because I was a candidate for a nipple and skin sparing mastectomy with an immediate reconstruction. So there was a lot of coordination that had to occur. I did have a slower growing cancer, so they weren't pushing it. It was very hard for me personally and just from a mental place to deal with months and months of delay surgery because they just couldn't get their schedules together. But between the time that they diagnosed me, because they found two types of cancer cells in the biopsy, they said they saw two masses. They thought I had invasive ductal carcinoma and invasive lobular carcinoma, which are both breast cancers. They're just different types. But when they actually got in and did the surgery, they only found one mass. It was much smaller. It was only one type of cancer. They can only estimate what's going on, but I did do a lot between my diagnosis diagnosis and when I actually had the surgery with nutrition, lifestyle, and even just being gentle with myself, leaning into the love of my community. And in my heart, I really believe that might have changed things. I don't know. I hear stories a lot of the time where it's gone the other way. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing that I do want to mention to your listeners, because I didn't know this and I wish I did then. If you do have a slower growing cancer and you do get delayed, the chances you really want this thing out of your body. And it's yeah. very hard to sit with it. And especially when they're trying to coordinate stuff, if it's slow growing, you're not at super high risk of it getting to some other point that's going to be really significant. But with my situation, I was happy that it was the other way, sure. that it was a bit less serious. They estimated me to be at a stage two. They were thinking I was going to have to do chemo, radiation, everything. And then the reality was much less serious. So that was really good. I did have a unilateral mastectomy. I did not move forward with the reconstruction on the other breast, which was recommended, but I decided I just wanted to be as is. Luckily in the States, insurance does have to cover any surgery like that. So if I want to change my mind in the future, I can. But when I went into for a consultation on my other breast for a matching surgery, the surgeon was really honest with me. And she said, truthfully, you're going to be trading symmetry for scars. Oh, and I like that perspective. Yeah. I was hoping she would say, we're going to make you look amazing. <laughs> but she yeah, just, She's she honest. Like, she was very honest. And I said, huh, that made me think. And I just said, I don't really know if I want that because one of the unexpected discoveries, I mean, they did mention that if you have a mastectomy, you're removing all of your nerve endings and therefore you lose all feeling in the breast. So if that is something that is an erogenous zone for you, you are essentially losing a part of that piece for yourself. And I didn't want to mess with the other side. <laughs> I just wanted to be, like I said, as is. And I don't regret that decision. I'm not sure if I'll change my mind. That's one thing I like to remind myself is, hey, that's okay. Just whatever you want for now is good. And if you want something different later, you can address that then. That's part of why I got into this field that I'm in now, because I did have one of those moments that a lot of cancer patients have, or it wasn't a moment, it was an evolution, I'd say, over the year post-treatment. I decided that I wanted to go back to school during lockdown in 2020. I had a, a really well-paying job in the legal industry but it wasn't something that I felt was fulfilling my purpose anymore. I liked that job, but it just, I don't know, things had changed for me. And so I went back to school to get certified in the nutritional therapy. And I wanted to help other breast cancer survivors because I really felt like once treatment ended, I didn't know where to go. And that's a common experience. I think anybody in the cancer world has where you've got this whole team behind you. And then once you're done, you're kind of expected to just jump back in. A lot of people struggle with that. I did so much work to figure out what I felt was the right path for me, but I realized there was a lot of conflicting information out there. And I just wanted to help people walk through it, not tell them what to do, because I just don't think that any health coaching should ever say, this is what you need to do. It has to be a collaborative effort, yeah. which I think I love your title of a cancer doula. We're walking this path with you. We're not taking you from 
A to B. Right. We're just walking you, <laughs> walking with you and helping you find your way in the dark. So here I am. I love addressing sexual side effects because that's an unexpected outcome of cancer. I work with an amazing team of professionals, sex therapists, pelvic floor, physical therapists, acupuncturists, but I also do my own private practice stuff where I support people from a nutritional and stress management perspective. If people want to really tackle things from all angles, that's what my work with the Rose City Sexual Health Collective does. And it's pretty incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. One thing I want to ask you, Juni, on a more personal note, I have talked to several women who have had breast cancer and they had the option, really it was their choice, to get lumpectomy, mastectomy, reconstructive, all those things. And some of the ladies shared with me that they felt pressured to get the reconstructive surgery. On a personal note, did you happen to feel that way at all? Didn't anyone say you should do this? Or did you get that from the surgeons or the healthcare team? I love that you're asking that question because I think it's a big, it's a problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I hear that all the time. I personally felt that my surgical team, which were both females, so I don't know if that makes a difference, mm. but they were both very, you can do whatever you want. However, I will say it felt like it was assumed that I would opt for reconstruction. Now that was always in my plan because I, I don't know, just on a gut level, I really wanted to maintain the shape. And that's been another thing as I've started walking into this cancer community, I see a lot of women who feel like they weren't told about the option of flat closure and there's a really interesting statistic that a friend of mine who's also a breast cancer survivor who opted for flat closure mentioned to me the other day is that the statistics show that a very high number of women who opt for flat closure, which is where you don't have any type of implant put in, that most of them are very satisfied with the outcome and are happy. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of women who do offer reconstruction are unhappy. <laughs> There's problems. Yeah. Yeah. And it does scare me a bit because I do have a history of autoimmune disease. And I don't feel like that was discussed with me that sometimes if you have a history of autoimmune disease that you shouldn't have an implant. They did discuss with me implant illness, the cancer that can be associated with implants. I don't have that particular type of implant that's been associated with cancer, but I do have a silicone implant. So I am aware of I've been educating myself about what are some of the things that I need to look for. And it does scare me, but I don't feel like I was pressured. It just was like the conversation was started with the assumption that was the path that I was going to take. Thank you so much for sharing that, Junie. And that might be the better way to say it. It was assumed that they would get the reconstructive surgery. And it's like you said, so many people, they just don't have all the information about the different options. Yeah. And that makes a big difference. That is why a lot of the women that did get the reconstructive surgery, they're so unhappy because they didn't know these other things could happen or they didn't know they might have to go back in another five years and have surgery again. Yeah. That information just was not shared. Yeah. And I think that's part of why I do what I do. And I'm assuming you do what you mm -hmm. do with my podcast, which is specifically for breast cancer. I just want people to have the information mm -hmm. that I don't that's feel right. like is commonly discussed so people can make informed decisions for themselves that are aligned. Implants aren't forever. <laughs> you don't right. just get them and, and then just go on. You have to go back and you have to swap them out. I believe it's 10 years. But if you have problems, which sometimes people have problems, yeah, you might have to go sooner and you may have to have multiple reconstructions, which brings up another point I think is great to discuss with people is a lot of people who haven't had breast cancer, there's a an easy joke that I think people make, which I try to tell people, this is the number one thing you don't say to a breast cancer patient is at least you got a free boob job. Oh, no. no <laughs> yeah, <way>. I, I <laughs> know you, <laughs> your face. Yeah, oh. I, you would be surprised that somebody actually said that to me on a date, a first oh, no. date. And I was like, 
oh, there's no second date. (laughs) No, there was no second date. But I did say, I know I think you're trying to be funny. And I just have to tell you, that's a pretty offensive thing to say to a breast cancer survivor. I'm going to let it go. But Yeah, he didn't handle that so well because it's not. It's a reconstructed breast and an augmented breast are two very different animals. (laughs) You're right, Joni. Yes. People are just not educated. You know, I'm sure he thought he was being funny and that kind of thing. But no, you really have to be mindful of what you say. The other one that gets me is, oh, at least you had the good kind of cancer. It's like, what? (laughs) Oh, yes, exactly. That Yes, totally. The good cancer. And it's like, there's no good cancer, unfortunately. Junie, you have talked about how you are like thriving and living your best life in your work after Mm -hmm. cancer. What are things looking like in your personal life? How are you thriving in your personal life? I think just One of the wonderful things about allowing cancer to be a crossroad for you to maybe take better care of your health or adopt some type of stress management practice or just follow your dreams. That's what I did. I just said, you know what? this is my life. I get one shot at this one (laughs) and I'm just going to do what I want to do and try to be of service to people, but also just live in my truth. And doing that has been so fulfilling, even though having your own business is a very (laughs) up and down experience, (laughs) right? Especially in these earlier years. I don't regret it for the world. I feel so happy because I feel like I'm in alignment. I feel healthier. I took pretty good care of myself prior to my diagnosis, but I have tuned in to my body in a totally different way. And I was meditating prior to my diagnosis. It really helped me get through. That was one of the reasons why I did that program. But I've really leaned into meditation, you know, post cancer. And that's been a life-changing experience for me. I just feel I have a peace that I didn't have before. And I have an appreciation for life. I think anybody who deals with cancer, whether it's early stage or not, you're faced with your mortality in a way that you just don't typically walk into unless you have a health crisis. That's right. Um, And I like to tell people, don't wait for the health crisis. I know it's a quick and powerful lesson a lot of the times, maybe not quick, but it's a powerful lesson that you can't ignore, but you don't have to wait for that to really take charge of your life. I take chances that maybe I wouldn't have taken before on myself and I feel very joyful I also feel like I feel my feelings more than I allowed myself to maybe in the past, because I think that's really important. I've learned a lot about just health in a really holistic way. Yes. It sounds like I'm listening to myself because (laughs) I I really get it. And you do have this awakening in Mm -hmm. so many different areas of your life and you do really realize what's important. Yes. So many people, especially those of us who've decided to walk a wellness path after our diagnosis, it's similar. Yeah. Just this, wow, I have to live in my truth. I want to be of service. And it's all encompassing health. You realize that it's holistic is a very, it's the appropriate term, but yeah. And that's another thing that's been so beautiful is meeting like-minded people who can relate So true. Junie, we hear the word root cause a lot in the holistic community. And (laughs) please share with us from your perspective what it means to address the root cause regarding hormonally driven breast cancer. That's such a good question. So we're going to talk specifically about hormonally driven breast cancer here is, you know, that's your diagnosis. Then you can assume that you had unbalanced hormones prior to your diagnosis. And most women I encounter, whether they're breast cancer patients, survivors or not, in this day and age, if you're maybe 35 plus, you're probably dealing with some type of or some degree of hormone imbalance because we live in such a stressful world. We're constantly exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals just in our everyday lives. And if you're not offsetting that and 
really taking care of yourself, it's just so easy to tip into hormone imbalance, which can, you know, me, I don't know. Are you tired and wired at night? Are you dealing with really stubborn weight issues? Are you having a hard time sleeping? Do you have a hard time managing stress? There's just so many different things. Do you get a slump in the afternoon because of dysregulated blood sugar? We've normalized, I think, hormone imbalance. Okay. We're, we think that's normal. We think it's normal every day at three to need a Starbucks before we head home and cook dinner and then go until you fall asleep scrolling through Instagram until two in the morning. That's just, that's a recipe for unbalanced hormones. And addressing root cause means looking at what types of hormone imbalance you might have. A lot of times with breast cancer, it's something called estrogen dominance, which just means not necessarily that you have too much estrogen or not enough estrogen. It just means that your estrogen progesterone balance is out of alignment and that we can look at that kind of thing. And so we are given these hormone blocking medications oftentimes as a long-term treatment after cancer, if it's breast cancer, ER, PR positive. And those can be really difficult for women. They block estrogen from feeding your cancer cells, any maybe circulating cancer cells. That is one way of preventing your cancer from coming back, but it's also not necessarily addressing the reason why your estrogen was feeding your cancer cells. Like that's not a normal situation. So by addressing the root cause, you are able to potentially experience a greater level of health than you had prior to your diagnosis. And that's, I think, a wonderful opportunity for people if they want to put in the work, because it usually does require some behavioral change. But at the end of the day, I'm super passionate about this because it will ripple out into all areas of your life. And a, a woman with balanced hormones, the woman that you see walking down the street who feels good in her skin is glowing from the inside out. That's probably a woman with balanced hormones. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And if you want to be that woman, you can be that woman. It takes a little bit of tweaking sometimes. When someone works with you and they want to get to the root cause of their hormonal imbalance, what does that look like? What are some mm -hmm. things that you ask them and mm -hmm. you explore with them? Sure. So there's a tool that I use in my practice. It's called the NAC, which is a nutritional assessment questionnaire. It's a very extensive questionnaire about all kinds of symptoms. And that helps us identify issues in some of the foundational health arenas. It also helps me really see, do you have dysregulated blood sugar? Do you have adrenal hypo or hyper function, which are like stress issues? Do you have some liver toxicity? There's a lot of things that we can see with that. And there are other tests that can be done, other like functional tests. If you're working with a naturopath or something, a lot of people like to use something called the Dutch test, which is one of the gold standards in terms of really getting specific information about what's going on with your hormones, because hormones are very hard to test yeah. from a blood perspective. And that's why a lot of regular doctors won't even do it, which is pretty valid because you're taking a snapshot of something. And if you're a woman, you're going to have multiple ups and downs, like things are flowing for you throughout the day, throughout the month. So it's really hard to get an idea of what's really going on without a bigger picture. The Dutch test, which I don't currently use in my practice, I might in the future, but I love using this questionnaire because ultimately we're going to be able to see a lot by you self-reporting with this really intense list of symptoms. If you get what I said, if you get this like slump in the afternoon, afternoon around three, where you just feel like you want to take a nap. If you get a little bit shaky before meals, if you experience being hangry, we can deduce you have blood sugar dysregulation. Those are classic signs. There are classic signs for high or low cortisol. There are classic signs for high or low estrogen or testosterone. There are a lot of things that we can see. And many times the approach is very similar. So instead of having my clients pay for an expensive test that's probably going to tell us something that may or may not be accurate, 
I use this other tool that we use and monitor over time on a regular basis to see how things are improving or changing despite with what tools we're using or approaches we're taking. So we're able to identify things like that. We're also able to identify signs of particular nutrient deficiencies. I I work in nutritional therapy. I use supplementation with my clients if that's something they're interested in, and it can really help amplify the effects of the dietary and lifestyle changes that we're making. It's not something I require my clients to do, but if you are doing those things like with diet and lifestyle and you want to push it along a little bit faster, supplementation can be great. But if you're not doing any of the lifestyle stuff, I don't want to throw supplements at it because it's basically not going to fix the foundational stuff and it can get expensive. So that's my perspective. There are some people really like to use supplements and require supplements. I don't, but I love using them. I take a lot of supplements myself and especially with my cancer clients, there are a lot of supplements. Again, I only like to use them if you're doing the other stuff that can really help you offset some of the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation, help speed healing after surgery, stuff like that. Joni, let's talk about the sexual side effects that one faces sometimes during cancer treatment and on their cancer journey. Are those things that people have to accept? No, they are not. And that's, I think, a really important thing to note. I was listening to an amazing episode that you did with a woman who is experiencing some really tough sexual side effects. And she created a dating app for people. Yeah, very interesting story. And I really feel for that. What is her name? Do you remember? Her name was Anna Leonarda felt for her. My heart was going out to her because she was like, if I had known that that I could have done some stuff like a pelvic floor PT, if we could have worked with her at the Rose City Sexual Health Collective, I really feel like we could do some things. But you know what? It's a personal choice. And if you don't want to go that route, nobody should ever feel like they need to do that. So I think it's wonderful that she has created that app and I wish her great success. But if you are experiencing sexual side effects, and a lot of the time it could be things like vaginal dryness, potentially painful intercourse, loss of libido, things like that. There is a lot that you can do. And there's a lot that you can do from just a health perspective. There are things that you can do supplementary, a lot you can do with your mind. Physical therapy, like I said, the pelvic floor PT, that is something I really hope blows up because I've started to hear a lot more about it. I've learned a lot more about it. I didn't even know it existed a couple of years ago. And I'm so happy that's a resource for people because a lot of the times you'll see the vaginismus is when there's like an involuntary sort of tightening of the vaginal opening that can cause painful intercourse for women. When you're on a hormone blocker and your estrogen has gone down, you can see atrophy of the tissues. You can see changes in the libido. And the great thing is that we can stoke the libido through holistic means, but there's also been a lot of good research on the power of mindfulness. And that has really blown my mind and has been wonderful. And I've gone down the rabbit hole with that. There's a book that I recommend a lot called Better Sex Through Mindfulness that was written by a woman named Lori Brado, who is a researcher. I believe she was a gynecologist or a sex therapist prior to devoting her life to this research. And she worked with a lot of people who had gynecological cancer women who felt that they had completely lost their libido or had painful intercourse and thought that they would never be able to have sex again. And she had incredible results with the power of mindfulness. Because a lot of the times what happens is a domino effect. If you're having lack of libido because which medications do certainly affect that and you're not able to get off of that medication, you can work with other ways of getting into your body. And sometimes it's just about changing your perspective on desire and as well as like physical arousal. A lot of women expect to have this arousal prior to their intimate moment with themselves or their partner. And sometimes it's about opening your mind, getting into your body and realizing that sometimes that desire can be cultivated once you start the process, as opposed to thinking that it has to happen before and lead up into this thing. So that's a very 
simplified way of describing that. But also for women who have a lot of pain during intercourse, there is a lot that you can work with there because there's something that in the mindfulness world we call spectatoring. So you get in your head, let's say you have painful intercourse. So it's, I'm sure there's a lot, there's a lot of anxiety probably involved with the act of intercourse because of course you're afraid that you're going to be in pain. Nobody likes to be in pain. So how do you change your relationship with the anxiety? How do you change your relationship with the pain itself, that's something she did a lot of, this same woman did a lot of work with to change the way that these women were perceiving the pain, the relationship to the pain. And she actually was able to help women greatly reduce the amount of pain, but also reduce the thoughts. Because if you don't feel like you can offer that to your partner, a sexual relationship, that is such a weight to bear mentally and emotionally. And so you're going to have all these thoughts. Oh gosh, I'm going to be in a lot of pain. Oh, that my partner is going to leave me. Oh, my partner, who would want to be with me if I can't do this? There's just so much going on. So how do we address that through the power of mindfulness, which allows you to detach from those thoughts, release those thoughts and utilizing other methods? Like if you are going to work with a sex therapist or something who can help with the communication, help the other person understand, there is just a lot (laughs) that can be done. So if you are experiencing this type of thing, please don't lose hope. There's a lot that you can do in many different realms, whether it's trying to address those things and overcome them or open your mind to other forms of intimacy. There's just so much that you can do and you don't have to let that be yet another thing that cancer takes away from you. Thank you, Junie, for explaining yeah. that. And yeah. I do want to note that the woman's name, her name is Anna. Anna. She created the Entwine dating yes. app. Yes. Amazing yes. woman. Great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was, I had never heard of anything like that. And I, I thought that was very interesting. Good luck to you, Anna, if you're listening. <laughs> We're rooting for you. (laughs) That's right. Junie, let's talk about trauma now, because in the holistic community, and it's been proven as well, that harboring trauma, unaddressed trauma, suppressed trauma can lead to sickness. How does trauma affect the body in other ways? And are there so many breast cancer patients who experience something heartbreaking prior to their cancer diagnosis? So what is that link between trauma and breast cancer? It's, yeah, this is such an interesting arena as well. And something I've been really trying to look at for myself and with others, because I will tell you, Every single one of my breast cancer clients, myself included, had a heartbreak, like whether it was the breakup of a marriage, a very painful divorce, loss of a child, loss of a career, something that just that the woman would say broke their heart. There is a physiological response in the body that occurs, and there have been books written about it. There is a whole realm of science called psychoneuroendocrinology or psychoneuroimmunology that is addressing this relationship between trauma, stress response, and disease. And when you experience something really traumatic, your body does start pumping out all of these different hormones, mostly stress-related hormones. We know stress and disease is connected. There have been studies on emotional trauma and how that creates a stress response that's ever happened to you that was really tough, that really broke your heart. And the thing about trauma is that it's different for everybody. You know, what, what breaks somebody's heart might just be water off a duck's back to somebody else. And it's not a game of comparison. And unfortunately, we don't get to choose the things that we have these really intensive responses to. But seeing emotions, that can also create different stress responses. If you're not addressing and dealing with things, it's hard to explain. But if we don't process our feelings, that's a very mysterious thing for people. It's like, well, okay, I Sure, I don't want to stuff my trauma, but how do I deal with that? A lot of that is just we need to learn how to sit with those things, not distract ourselves with food, shopping, alcohol, drugs, sex. 
you know, we are so good at not sitting in discomfort. And that's another reason why I really subscribe to the power of mindfulness Mm because I had to teach myself how to sit with emotions. And a lot of the times it's really just a matter of breaking it down to sensations in the body. I love to use sort of reparenting techniques for myself when I'm feeling something. And I literally will sometimes even out loud, just talk to that emotion without judgment, just let it be, maybe ask it what it's, what's going on there. What is the fear that it's bringing up? What is the pain that it's bringing up instead of analyzing it or trying to tell it, you need to get over that. Just like you would with a child or with the self-soothing, like if a child hurts themselves, there's usually two options. They're saying, Hey, walk it off or you're fine. Get over it. Or just saying, oh, come here, holding them, soothing them, just saying, yeah, that probably hurt. Just being with them. And what do you think is going to be the most powerful way to overcome that? Are we going to teach ourselves to just push it away or deflect? Because then it's going to come back somehow. <laughs> That's right. Because stress hormones cause inflammation. It's a healing mechanism. But if you are stuck in a state of chronic stress, you can cause imbalance in the body that can lead to disease. And with cancer, as I'm sure you're very well aware, we all have cancer cells in our body. Is your immune system strong enough to deal with it? Or are you potentially in a state of chronic stress, either due to environmental, emotional, hormonal imbalance that it just tips over? And I think sometimes for the trauma piece, is when it just tips over. If you're a sailboat, it's that gust of wind that just causes the ship to capsize or something. I think that triggers it. Yeah. It's a trigger. Yeah. I think that in our society, it's not talked about enough that, hey, it's okay to be emotional, to cry, to be mad, but just don't get stuck there. You have to acknowledge those feelings. And when you don't, it's literally making you sick because you just keep piling things on top of it. And if there's no way, if you have no outlet on how to work through that, you're creating a... I almost want to say like a trail of possible illnesses that you could create, help to create or manifest, I should say. Yeah, it's intense. And there's a man, have you heard of Gabor Mate? I have not, no. Oh, so he wrote a book on this exact subject. And it's called When the Body Says No. And it's basically like how trauma and stuff is causing illness, the stress disease connection. And he just came out with a new book called The Myth of Normal. And it's all about how we've gotten so far from our authentic selves, how as a culture, we don't know how to deal with our emotions. And it was very interesting because a lot of our coping mechanisms, we learn subconsciously in our childhood. And he was talking about the importance of allowing a child to deal with anger. I think you mentioned anger. And I think that is specifically one we really struggle with in America. Especially for women. We're not supposed to be able to get angry. (laughs) No, <laughs> you know? no. Yeah. And how do you address that? How do you process that without losing control? I think a lot of us feel like we'll lose control. I'm excited to read this book, this myth of normal. But he said specifically, like when a child gets angry, if you put them on a timeout alone in a room, that's actually sending them the message that when you're angry, you are refused love. And I thought that was really powerful. That is very powerful and accurate. Yeah. Accurate. Yeah. I felt that way before. I better keep my cool, keep it together because I don't want to be rejected by these people or the people I love. Yes. Yeah. And and that doesn't mean go ballistic. (laughs) Every time you get angry, we do need to process those feelings and you can learn how to communicate them. But a child can't regulate their emotions like an adult can. So when we send those messages in childhood, yeah, I unfortunately, I don't know. I can't, I haven't read the book, so I can't offer what his specific (laughs) solution is, but I thought that was a very powerful just statement of that's what that's saying. And I think most of us probably experience that. 
I certainly know I have, and I don't blame my parents for it because I wouldn't know what else they to do. They didn't know I either. Keep, yeah. We're all doing the best that we can. And that's yeah. that's another thing with all of these. It can be overwhelming sometimes, especially if you're trying to improve yourself or change your life after a diagnosis or prior to a diagnosis. It's like, okay, I have to live in alignment and I have to deal with mm-hmm. my traumas and I have to eat right. Let it be a journey that's joyful. Don't let it be yet another form of stress in our extremely stressful world. That's an excellent point. I love that. (laughs) Do it at your own pace, but just make sure you do it and take care of yourself. Before we wrap up, Junie, I have to ask this very important question that I'm sure a lot of people that are on the other side of cancer are wondering, what are some foods that can help prevent breast cancer recurrence? Yeah, sure. I mean, Again, everybody's different, but there are some foods that it's pretty universally accepted, whether you're vegan, ketogenic, anti-inflammatory, whatever. I think some of the most important foods to emphasize for breast cancer patients are all the vegetables, as many vegetables as possible, but specifically cruciferous vegetables. Those vegetables have compounds in them that can really help you eliminate estrogen, harmful estrogens. Making sure that you're getting enough fiber in your diet is super key because that's one of your detox pathways. If you're constipated, constipated means that you are pooping less than one time a day. If you're not doing that, and a good check mark for people is within the first 20 to 30 minutes of waking up, without the stimulus of coffee, you should be having a bowel movement. What that indicates to you, if that's going on, is that your liver is working well because during the night, your liver is trying to process a lot of these toxins and that your detoxification pathways are open because a bowel movement is a form of detoxification. You're moving things out of the body, urine, sweat, all these different things. So making sure that you're having a bowel movement and getting enough fiber in the diet, I don't think most people do because it it takes some conscious effort. So getting those vegetables in, specifically the cruciferous, so that's broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. I love flax for breast cancer patients. You do need to make sure that you're grinding the flax fresh. Don't buy the pre-ground stuff at the store because it's super duper sensitive. So when it's pre-ground, it can oxidize real easily. So I like to buy it whole, grind it. You can put it in a smoothie. You can put it on oatmeal. I also love there's a bread that I eat. It's like a paleo bread that's made from almond flour, flax seed, psyllium husk. That has a lot of fiber in it. <laughs> and if I eat a couple slices of that bread, which I love, I put a little bit of organic flaxseed oil on it instead of butter. And oh my gosh, it's really tasty. And that keeps me very regular. <laughs> that's um, good. Yeah. But also making sure you're getting adequate protein in. I love salmon is probably wild caught salmon is probably my favorite protein for breast cancer surgery survivors because you have your anti-inflammatory omega-3 fats in there. You got a good source of protein. It's clean. It's relatively low mercury. What else? What else? There's so many good foods. I really just think emphasizing a wide array of colorful fruits and vegetables, specifically emphasizing vegetables and the cruciferous proteins Go with organic, (laughs) sizing fish, nuts, seeds. Some people do great with beans and that can be a really nice source of fiber. I don't tend to do super well with beans. So I don't, (laughs) I only eat those on occasion and you can soak beans prior to consuming them or cooking them, which will help if you have a little bit of digestive issues with that. It just helps the process, starts the sprouting process, which makes them a little bit easier to digest. Broccoli sprouts, you can do those. Those are just the ones that are coming to mind right now. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's very helpful. Junie, before we wrap up, Uh tell the audience more about your podcast, Tata (laughs) Cancer, Uh and what can they expect to get after listening? Sure. So I created Tata Cancer because being diagnosed at 41, although I wouldn't consider that a spring chicken, it's definitely younger than most women that are diagnosed with breast cancer. Typically, you're going to see maybe 60s and, and beyond. That's a more 
common age. And a lot of the material that's out there for breast cancer survivors and patients is geared towards that age group. So I wanted to create a resource that looked at things that affected the youngish breast cancer community. So women 50 and under, although my podcast is really for anybody, but I wanted to look at what if you have small children? How do you navigate that? How do you navigate dating? That's a big thing I talk about a lot is like I just said, I went on a date with the guy who said, at least you got a free boob job. <laughs> uh, you know, how do we talk about things like that with humor? But really it's an exploration of what does it mean to heal after you've been diagnosed with breast cancer. So during the process, I talk a lot about these are ways that you can support the body. These are other avenues and complementary things that you can explore. I bring on a lot of experts. I'm going to have you on and I can't wait to talk to you. And just trying to give as much information as possible about some of the things that you just might not hear from your doctor that may really enhance your outcomes, make the process easier for you, allow you to deal with some of these emotional traumas, and then be able to move forward in your life in a way that you feel really aligned with. So yeah. I don't preach specific pathways. I really just try to offer information and my own exploration and experience and try to give you what you need to make the best decisions for you. That's been the goal. I just had a one year anniversary of the podcast and it's Congratulations. been such a beautiful experience. Thank you. Yeah. Please tell the audience where they can find your podcast, but then also if they're interested in working with you, where can they find you and how can they work with you? Yeah, absolutely. So the podcast is Talk Talk Cancer. I'm on all the major podcast platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. I'm also on Instagram. If you want to find me on social media, I am at Junie Be Well. I'll make sure you have all the links to this. My website is juniebewell.com. There is a little form there, a contact form. If you want to have a free consultation and just talk and see if maybe working together would be a good option for you, I do offer that and we can chat and see if it would be a good fit. And I offer nutritional therapy, but it's a very holistic approach. And then you can also find me on on the Rose City Sexual Health Collective's website where you can see all the other practitioners there as well. I'm on TikTok. I'm not very active on there. It's just so much social media <laughs> and <Yes>. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I'm at Junie B on, on Facebook as well. So yeah, I love hearing from people. So please reach out to me. I will make sure to include Junie's information in the listen notes. So if anyone is interested, you will have that information. Junie, thank you so much for talking with me and sharing so much wonderful information for our listeners and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. I appreciate what you're doing as well. It was an honor to be on your show. Before we end today, I would like to give a shout out to the listeners. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please share, follow, or subscribe so that you can easily find my podcast and listen again. That is it for this Wednesday. And until next time, let's keep navigating cancer together. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Navigating Cancer Together. I hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to subscribe. And if you enjoyed the show, please share or tell your friends and family about it. For notes from the show and previous episodes, visit ontheotherside.life and check out the podcast section. I would love it if you joined us for the next episode. Talk to you soon.